navigation by olfaction demonstrated in humans? No, we were just talking about that. And um, I just talked to Mary um, Hegarty, and there are no um, empirical, well, there, there's um, empirical studies in blind people showing that um, they can use um, odors to, to um, navigate and to compensate. And there's actually a Japanese group that's cr produced a portable olfactometer to deliver odorants to blind people to train them to use it. But that's there's literally like like very few studies. Uh, it's not it's not mainstream. And and what um, it's mostly it's anecdotal is, is that it's very um, important to hunters and sailors and Polynesian people and and everyone agrees that it's it's important. Um, but it but it's not. It's not being um, considered in, well, it's very hard to study, <laughs> to control it. That's, I mean, I think that's why. But the, yeah, and in fact, um, so um, that's what, uh, I was hearing great anecdotes about people, uh, hunters in Ecuador who um, drop to the ground to smell um, a, a trail, for example, a track, yeah. yeah. So great area for, for research, yeah. Find out where the wine snobs get lost less. If, if who gets lost less? Find out where the wine snobs get lost less. <laughs> <laughs> that you know that that unless they're so specialized for discrimination that they're useless at navigation. I mean, or whether people there are people who have a great sense of direction. I'm not one of them. Do they have? Um, do people have a great? Do they have a better sense of smell? I, it's apparently smell thresholds are better in reproductive age women, um, but search and rescue. Um, uh, dog trainers, you know, breed dogs for, for, for this, and they, um, they're, they're convinced it's young, intact males who are the best trackers, which, which would make sense because, again, you think about sex differences in space use, male, in, a, in dogs, you expect males would, should be um, tracking large, large um, areas, and so they should be more, more sensitive. But that's, again, that's just a, um, there's, there's even on dogs, um, sniffing, sniffer dogs and search and rescue dogs and all the way dogs are used for odors, there are less than 20 um, papers, empirical papers on how dogs are actually learning about odors and using them to navigate. The, the most, their most papers are insects, uh, moths, um, in, invert, uh, aquatic animals and, uh, and homing pigeons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was curious, what, what would be... The, the, the size phenomenon that you have, so that there's the size of these structures is correlated with aspects of their ecology. Um, why do you need bigger structures? I mean, what, what's the actual, is it, is it more hard drive for storing the spatial representations? Is it, you know, because there's this interesting thing when you look at the Finley and Darlington stuff, that the brain size scaling, in, in a certain way, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if brain tissue is expensive. It's not clear why you should just make all parts of the brain bigger as the body gets bigger necessarily. Well, I, I mean, I think she would argue it's not, you know, it's not ideal, but that's just, it's just a developmental constraint. Uh, right. but, but, I mean, the olfactory bulb, so that, I mean, you know, the bulb size is, uh, indicates how many glomeruli you've got. And each glomerulus is, is in, you know, specific for one um, receptor. So, so that you would have, you know, it, it so I mean, you could see it both ways. Obviously, if you if you're a wolf and you you're increasing your home range size, then there's more odorants that you have to discriminate, and oh, more odorants that you have to map. Now, what um, what I would argue is that um, if you look at the um, the wiring of the olfactory bulb, it um, and you compare that to the wiring of the accessory olfactory bulb, which I'm arguing is not is not spatial, you see very different mapping from the um, epithelium to the glomerulus. And um, what you see in the olfactory bulb looks more like two sensory um, structures that, are, that have to be used in stereo to, to work. Now, this is, um, Ken Katanian just showed this in, in, um, in, in moles, that if um, he replicating the same study in ants, that if you have an ant who is orienting to an odorant, and then you 
you know, you cut off one antenna, then they overshoot one direction, you cut off the other antenna, they overshoot the other direction, and you take the antenna, you cross them, and they're completely disoriented, and they can't recover, you know, on a short term. And, and Ken just did the same thing in moles, where he put tubes in their nose, and he either blocked one tube or crossed the tubes, and the ones with the crossed tubes could, ab could, could not um, orient. And, and, um, and that was to a piece of earthworm, you know, a, a foot away from them. Uh, they were completely like walking over it. They were completely disoriented, and and that's been um, that's also been you know the idea that you need stereo olfaction. That's actually also been shown in cataglyphous ants, which are incredibly visual, um, in uh, in sharks. So so that there's something about stereo olfaction. Now, if it's just discrimination, why don't you just have one big hose that pulls in lots of odorant? It, it, the reason you have stereo is to is to compare. You know, delay lines. To, you know, you look. It's it's for direction, and and um, and that's in fact the impairment you're seeing is direction is directional impairment. So so that, I mean that, that uh, and and the whole factory bulb is set up that way to to, you know, where they come in and then the data come in and that goes immediately is um, compared at the um, at the mitral tufted cell, which is the, the first and which both in the honeybee and in the the mammal. Um, it looks like these symmetrical inputs come in, and then they're and then they're compared. Yeah. So I was thinking about the um, the stereo component of it, and and I'm puzzled what happens in marine mammals because here you have animals that, that navigate long distances often, right? Um, while the neural architecture can remain the same at um, the proximate sensory end, they have the problem that the the breathing system that in their terrestrial ancestors was being used, if you're right, for olfactory navigation, now certainly no longer has a stereo component and um, arguably potentially is a liability for animals that dive long periods of time, right? So if well, mar marine mammals, yeah, I mean, th so that's what you're talking about, marine mammals, right, not, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, they, I'm they don't have any they... olfactory system. I mean, you know, there's no olfactory information coming in to marine mammals. They, they either, and they usually either have very reduced um, systems or they, they have um, a larger system if they breed on land. So, you've, um, so it, it seems like it's being used like, you know, seals that breed on land um, have, um, are using probably terrestrial odors. Um, but, but no, it, yeah, but, so but underwater they're not using it. Yeah. They have right. very long migratory paths. Yeah. But, but they're, they, they must be doing something differently. Yes, yes. No, they, they I mean, so secondarily, um, marine animals basically lost their olfactory system underwater. They, so frogs um, have, fish and frogs have an air nose and a water nose. But once you get um, outside of um, amphibians, we lost the water nose. And no one's ever got it back again. Um, and it, what's, um, uh, the, um, what's, it, what's, yeah. So and, and that's and what's interesting actually is that um, they're competing against um, n you know animals who've never left the water like you know who are incredibly good and needs you know like sharks using sterile faction and they're using the lateral lines actually they need input from the lateral lines um, and sterile faction to be able to orient and um, um, but but things like um, harbor seals. Um, have these, you know, basically using their vibrissi to detect um, water currents. That's what's been, you know, they're very, very sensitive to water currents, and that's when suggested because they don't, they can't, v vision doesn't work underwater for, um, for any distance. So really, in fact, even in early, even animals who've never left the, left the water, vision can only be used under short um, distances, whereas if an olfactory field is stable and can be tracked, then it's it's the only. I mean, magnetic fields and and olfactory fields are the only and and like you know landscape slope or something. Those are the only directional cues you've got. And olf and the advantage, of course, of olfaction is that not only are you getting um, a north south um, compass information, but you're actually getting uh, identity. So it's you you know that it is that. Particular, you know, patch of vegetation or prey item or something like that. So it's it's not just it's not just compass like a magnetic field, but it actually gives you, um, you know, real uh, data, real um, conditional stimulus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm 
memory or learning system when the association between olfactory cues and the physical direction changed over time or across different places? No, I mean, these are, these are all incredibly important questions. And um, they're, um, it, it's, you know, you've got um, the people, um, stud the camps of people studying olfaction are asking different questions. And, the, and so, um, for example, I was saying, I was talking to, um, to Clark about this, is that the, um, a rat moving through in the dark is um, moving its whiskers at the same frequency as it's sniffing which is the same frequency as the medial septum is driving hippocampal activity. This is a theta rhythm. And as soon as the rat stops moving, medial septum shuts down, hippocampus theta rhythm shuts down, and, and, and the, the septum is actually sending the theta rhythm to all parts of the hippocampus. And it happens to be a, um, at the, approximately the same frequency as sniffing and the same frequency as animals moving its whiskers. And clearly, if you have, if you're trying to integrate, if you're moving in a natural field, you've got, and you're trying to integrate wind and odorant, you'd want to have good mechanosensory uh, systems like whiskers. But there's a field of uh, neuroscientists who study whiskers, and then there's the field who study olfaction. And there's no study that has combined them, despite these both being huge fields. Because again, it's the, you know, it's you, if olfaction is discrimination, you're studying it in nose pokes and pushing levers and, and, and static environments with no navigation. Um, there's, there's place cell studies where animals will, there are pots of odorants, and animals will use pots of odorants. And if you rotate them, the place cells rotate. So it's, it's clear that uh, rats will orient to um, odorants in the field, I mean, in the lab. But it's, it's all, it's being, they're being used as, as like small positional cues like, like landmarks. Oops. Yeah. So you ended the talk on this very cosmic note, where. Um, Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. But um. <laughs> so I was just trying to think of what the. Too much coffee, be, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, if, um. if it's true that there's this, you know, deep history in which olfaction was the first problem, and that put us on a vector, in terms of brain structure and, and modern mind. I was trying to think through what, how we might detect any trace, or if you think we might, and I, one of the problems is that if, if olfaction functions as a map, then any <coughs> mechanism to solve any problem is going to be somewhat isomorphic with the parameters of the problem it's trying to solve. So here, at any modern um, like human mental mechanism, to the extent that it's representing the world or different uh, variables in the world, that's a kind of a map. So, how, so what would be particular to olfaction? Right, right. No, 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 no. Exactly. What, what? Is a map. The world is. Yeah. You know, anything else is a map. So, so what? Have you speculated well, about? Well, you know what I think it's. I mean, I think it's a parallel map structure that I think. I mean, this is complete. You know, that the idea that because we have these um, odor percepts, that's that's like a signature that there is this underlying parallel map structure, which is a really, really good way of organizing information <coughs> globally and locally and <coughs> flexibly. Um, that you might use it as, I mean, it'd be a great way to organize semantic memory. Um, I, I mean, I have not put all these pieces c together, but people like Peter Todd and um, that school uh, are, you know, are thinking about um, how we, you know, cognition as search. And, and I actually talked to him a year or so ago and said, well, you mean, you're actually saying cognition is, you know, um, thinking is navigation. And he was calling it search. I said, yeah, but it's really navigation. I mean, you should be thinking of it as navigation. And, I, and, so, and that's my own, you know, the, it, the brain started that way. It makes sense that thinking is, um, is modeled on the same, the same um, logic. Right. No, yeah. but so, so and to the extent that, as I was trying to explain, but maybe not so clearly, um, maybe not enough coffee, um, but that <laughs> you're trying to navigate a space. So, so it seems fine to me to, to go with the idea that any given cognitive problem will have its element of navigation in it. Yeah, OK. Um, but I was wondering if you were implying that there was something particular to olfaction, or, or, or whether that was just one means to an end and it doesn't. Well, I, th I think it, it started the ball rolling and it constrained our evolution. So it's not, it's, and, and it just because, you know, we evolved from single-celled animals, all of whom use chemosensory um, stimuli to move in space. 
and and to process information. I mean, every the world was chemosensory, and that's where we that's whatever. However, the first um, you know multicellular nervous system, like when the first neuron evolved, it was had to have been responding to chemosensory information. That that's and and. Um, and then there's, you know, and then a mystery, you know, and then a miracle happened, and and we've got all the miracle, all the phyla, and no fossil record um, of what came before. Um, so, but um, the, um, and, and and in fact, by the time we have any fossil record, we've got incredible visual systems as well as you know olfactory systems. Um, so, but so I mean, so and it's a huge. Um, uh, leap, and it may completely be untrue that the um, that it, this parallel map structure could have bootstrapped everything because it's such a simple idea. Um, the only um, you know po again, this is the only possible bit of evidence um, independently. Chuck Stevens at at, at Salk has um, been working on computational models of piriform cortex and at neurosciences. Um, his group came up to my poster and said, "Oh, that first neighborhood thing. That looks. That's exactly what we think the piriform is doing. That's what. It, and and that's that's what that's what it should be doing because I would. I'm saying that the olfactory bulbs are sending, you know, simple gradients to the next level, which is the piriform, which should be making this actually first like olfactory um, bearing map. So anyway, yeah. but but there's this. Um, that means that there should be place specific cells in in the piriform." Um, for for odors, um, no no one's no one done that because animals are you know because animals are fixed in place when they're when you record from that, so that that could be done and, and I could be all, totally wrong. So I'm hoping to find out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the risks of you know visiting an anthropology department is that um, we're, we're uh, anthropocentric and uh, so you know prone to look at living things through the lens of our particular species. Um, it, it, it seems to me that. As intriguing as a hypothesis as this is, it doesn't seem to line up with um, with human beings very well, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, uh, but then, the reason that matters is not necessarily because we're exclusively concerned with understanding humans, but because if what that says is that subsequent selection pressures can can push things around a lot, then you know a big cross species comparison won't necessarily reveal the the predicted patterns, say between home range size um, and and um, uh, neuron area devoted to uh, olfactory processing if subsequent selection is, is, is moving things around. So in, in humans, um, women have more cortical area devoted to olfactory processing hmm. than men do. Hmm. They have better memory mm -hmm. uh, for odors. They have better olfactory acuity. They report more dreams with odors in them than mm -hmm. men do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, olfaction plays a bigger part in mate hmm. selection for women than mm -hmm. it does for men. Um, but depending on which measures of navigation ability you want to use, um, uh, either across the board men have better spatial cognition or um, if you don't like those measures, uh, men seem to be the ones who rely on the bearing based system mm -hmm, more than the mm -hmm, landmark based mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no, uh, that's which, which runs the, yeah. counter to your prediction if I understand. Well, you know, I mean, what I would say is that, I mean, because we, you know, that's um, that, that men are the primitive case. And they're yeah, using, my wife tells me that. <laughs> but I mean that's you know um, it's it's really, <laughs> um, and because we've got we've done virtual environment work with men and women and and men are sensitive to slope um, on, in a virtual environment the way women aren't any direct they're much more sensitive directional cues than than women so um, and so I think that I mean this is also true um, in male and female rats that. The, the male comes in and solves a maze very quickly using a few distant landmarks, using the bearing map, and females come in and they learn the distant and they use learn the proximal and they learn everything. And females learn the maze much more slowly, but then you cue, you know, you ask them later what they know, they know more about the environment. Um, so I would, I mean, so I've always, um, I've interpreted this as um, males uh, are using a simple, quick, simple system because it works best for moving over large landscapes that they're, they're shortcutting around. They don't need the detailed, um, the detailed evidence. Um, and so women are, in fact, use and where you know, and, and est all the estrogens are, in fact, um, you know, collected in CA1, and um, so, it, and and you get increased dendritic branching. In, in a more LTP and estrus during the rat and all that. So it's CA1 is clearly where, which is a sketch map. So I would imagine, yeah, women are using, um, they're using 
sketch, they're making, they're making sketch map deductions from olfaction. They probably also are doing bearing map. But this is all about the, just using it for the bearing map. And it could be that you've got different odorant receptors and, um, in, in women that uh, are being used for that. <coughs> now, I mean, that's really, I mean, you know, I, I think that it, exactly, given this pattern, then you could modulate it. Um, I, yeah. I also, um, well, I'm not, the next, just, be, I was a postdoc with Steve Gollin at Pittsburgh, so I've also, um, Come from uh, have had some experience in anthropology, so I did have, I did want I did want to put up um, one one just this picture that uh, and and some of Robert Barton's data is that it is striking that um, these you know the the difference in nose morphology and therefore the difference in olfaction between the groups of primates and um, you know you expect relatable back to should be larger and dispersed social system dispersed. I mean that, and so but actually, this is what Robert um, Barton has shown in you know, and he with many many caveats, um, very small biased samples, but he did you know phylogenetic contrasts and and showed that um, you've got um, fruit in, in all in catarines, strepsirenes, and platyrenes, you've got. Uh, uh, frugivores have relatively larger olfactory bulb than uh, folivores, but you know if you're navigating to odors like fruiting trees, that makes sense. Um, this is probably not where I want to end the talk because you guys, I'm sure, can rip all the data apart. I'm not a primate person, but I did want to put that up. And and then in the the um, the social system, the strepsirenes, the more um, you have larger olfactory bulb in the dispersed relative to polygynous relative pair. And, and, and I think these things are barely if, or just a trend in terms of statistics. This is a very small sample size. And they were all, it was also confounded with nocturnality. And, but the platyrenes, you show the opposite, um, the opposite pattern. And um, so it, it, again, um, I'm not saying I can explain all this, but, but um, right now we don't have any other explanation for it. And I think it's, it's, it'd be interesting to start Try, trying out um, to look at olfact, you know, at, at primate brains in terms of um, navigation again, but not, but not, not just hippocampus, but hippocampus, you know, and, and olfactory bulb. Okay. <laughs>